Hello and welcome. Today I'm going to talk about the AWS Cloud Development Kit, a useful tool for defining cloud infrastructure. So let's say you're building an application and you need some cloud resources. Let's say you want an Amazon S3 bucket. Well, there's a number of ways that you can create this resource for your application. One is you can go into the AWS web console, into their GUI, and create a bucket manually that way. Or you can use the command line and uh, use this AWS make bucket command, which is really just calling the make bucket API uh, endpoint. Or you can write CloudFormation in JSON or YAML, and this is a way of defining the bucket using markup. Or you can draw it and create it in Amazon's CloudFormation designer. Or you can write Terraform to define your bucket. Or you can write Amazon CDK to define your bucket. So what's the difference between these uh, different approaches? Well, one big difference is manual versus infrastructure as code. Now, the creating the bucket manually in the console or with the uh, in the GUI, you know, that's kind of a one-off event. But really, we want to define our infrastructure as code. And why is that? Well, if our infrastructure is the finest code, we can put it in version control. So we can have reviews of it, have all the history of what our infrastructure used to look like, all the great things that come with version control. We can deploy our code, our infrastructure, to different environments. So we can have a dev environment, a production environment. And because our infrastructure is defined as code, it's easy to replicate exactly what we have in the different environments. And you can do a deployment using CloudFormation and it's not perfectly atomic, but in general, it'll either succeed or fail. And you can always have the option to roll back to the last good known state. Uh, and you can also create higher level constructs and reuse them across your projects, either within your application or across other applications. If you have certain patterns and certain pieces of, of infrastructure, you find yourself creating often. So CloudFormation is a bit like AWS machine code. It's kind of a foundation layer that describes all the resources that belong in a stack in your account. And uh, there's high-level high tools that sort of compile down into CloudFormation, uh, stuff like Terraform, Serverless, CDK. These are all tools that will abstract out some of the details of writing CloudFormation by hand uh, and let you kind of get on with the easier task of describing the resources in some more abstract, succinct fashion. So CloudFormation, like everything else in Amazon, is an API. Uh, kind of the first API that you want to use with it is create stack. And this is a sample call to create stack. And you pass in a template body. This CloudFormation template defines different resources that belong to your stack. And each resource has a type and a set of properties that go with it. Now, when you create a stack, you will have all these resources. And you can see it in the GUI, for example, here in the web console, you can see the different resources that are created as part of this stack. We can have IAM roles or policies, Lambda functions, databases, DynamoDB, everything. Uh, and these resources you can, of course, look up in the documentation. And they have all the different resource types as well as their properties are all documented here. So this is, for example, a couple properties of the S3 bucket. Uh, for example, access control. We can set the property whether or not the bucket is public. Uh, as one of the properties on the S3 bucket resource. Now, CloudFormation itself isn't the greatest thing to work with. It can be very verbose, especially when you're defining things like a Bastion EC2 host or a uh, application that's behind a load balancer or a VPC. Uh, it's also just plain markup, so it's hard to kind of reuse and package up into modules with inputs and outputs. It's possible, but it's not very friendly. And the same with writing conditional uh, or logic or anything like that. If you want to have some custom logic where you have different values, you know, depending maybe on the environment that it's in. Again, it is technically possible with cloud information, but it's really very limited and uh, not very fun to write. You know, the IDE support isn't great. Like maybe the best you're going to get is some auto completion of properties and types, but you know, it's, it's pretty limited in what it can give you. And you refer to all the different resources by name or by ID. And so if you want to have connections between resources, it can be very hard to see that just with you know, a big pile of markup to see what's connected to what. So fortunately, we have Amazon CDK that we can uh, use to work around some of these limitations. Now, 
Conceptually, a CDK application is made up of one or more stacks, and these correspond to CloudFormation stacks. And these stacks have constructs, which is a grouping of resources, of CloudFormation resources. And you can define this in different languages. You can write it with TypeScript or Java or .NET or Python. And you write it imperatively, and it compiles down into CloudFormation, basically just outputs the resources that you end up defining with this program. Now, there's sort of three layers of CDK constructs. And the first layer, the base layer, is just uh, a construct that mimics exactly the CloudFormation resource itself without really any abstraction. And you know, if in TypeScript or Python, for example, this would be some class that represents, has the same properties that your CloudFormation resource has. In layer two, we have a more convenient API that has sensible defaults, uh, maybe a bit more abstraction that lets you easily define more complex um, constructs, resource sets of resources, everything. And then we can combine those into patterns, what are called la layer three architectural patterns. And these can be very complex applications or pieces of applications to you know, pr potentially create any number of CloudFormation resources behind the scenes. So a uh, typical CDK call would look something like this. So we can here we're creating an S3 bucket in TypeScript and Python and C Sharp and Java. And they all do basically the same thing. You give it a ID, the my bucket there, and then you pass in a list of properties for that bucket. Here's a more complex example. Uh, so this is a CloudFormation stack built with CDK that generates a VPC, a virtual private cloud. And this includes you know, all the subnets and routes and policies, security groups, everything that constructs a VPC. And you can change some of the defaults. It has parameters. But for the most part, the, the defaults are sensible for what most people need. And you can specify, for example, how many private subnets you want or public subnets. All that kind of good stuff are exposed as kind of high-level knobs. This creates a ECS cluster that we can run basically Docker images in. And this creates a application from a Docker image from Amazon ECS sample there. Uh, and it throws it in Fargate and basically runs your Docker image somewhere in Amazon and creates a load balancer and puts it in front of it. There's a reason this is the first functional example that's shown in the documentation. It shows off the power of the high-level constructs. Now, the equivalent CloudFormation template to that is about 500 lines. So if we create these low-level modules and assemble them into more abstract modules and create reusable patterns, we can abstract out a lot of the repetitive and verbose CloudFormation resource primitives that we would normally have to write by hand. So here, all the security groups, load balancer, listener, target group, task role, IAM policy, everything else is generated for us just from those few lines of code. Now, if you're lazy like me, this is terrific. Uh, but I want to show also a live demo where we can go through creating a CDK stack from scratch and deploy it and see kind of what the process looks like from a code standpoint. I'm going to go ahead and create a project from scratch, if you want to follow along here. So I'm going to create a new directory. And we're going to initialize it for a TypeScript project. And so uh, it creates a little skeleton for us. And let's open it up here. So the first thing that uh, we can take a look at is this bin CDKTS. And this is where we define our stack. And to create our stack, we really just create an instance of, a, uh, of our stack. And our stack is defined over here in lib. And so right now, it's an empty stack, and it looks something like this. Um, now, in this file, we can actually deploy our stack multiple times. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you have uh, you know, a dev stage production environments, for example. Or you want to ha add some parameters to your stack that customize its deployment. Um, whatever you want, it's up to you. You can pull in environment variables and use them to uh, control the configuration, or you can hard code it all here. So for example, if you have an application and you know where it should be deployed to you know, for your uh, company, you can define exactly the AWS account and region for each environment and just hard code that here, which is great. Um, but you can also define, for example, um, environment variables and use those to control the region and account that it's deployed to if you want to share your stack and let people deploy it anywhere. It's really up to you how you want to uh, manage that kind of stuff. 
Uh, so our stack here, we created an instance of this, and right now it's empty. So let's go ahead and add, let's say, a S3 bucket. So the first thing to know is that um, all the different uh, areas, all the different APIs or CloudFormation families uh, have different modules on NPM. So I'm going to install the AWS S3 uh, module here, and then we can import that. So I can do import star as S3 from, all right, typing's not so good to be. Okay. Uh, and then if we want to create an S3 bucket, it's as simple as new S3.bucket. And then we pass it the current context. So basically it's parent. So that would be this. And then we give it some name. Um, the name should be unique within the current scope, but it doesn't have to be globally unique. So we could call it like, you know, public bucket. And then we can pass it a list of properties. So for a bucket, one of the properties we have is access control. And uh, then we can say bucket access control dot public, for example. And so uh, what this will do is create us a S3 bucket that uh, lives in our stack and with this name public bucket and then some prefix to make it unique in the current um, scope. So Taking that, we should be able to do CDK synth the size. And this will compile our little application and output some cloud formation. So the real you know, thing to notice here is this is our S3 bucket right here that we defined. So you can see that it's got our name public bucket with some suffix, creates an S3 bucket resource with a property access control public read. Pretty cool. And of course, if we want, we can go ahead and deploy this. And in the meantime, we can get a little bit fancier here. So uh, one thing we can do is we can have our stack take some properties. So you can think of it kind of like a React component, for example. We could define a CDK stack props. And maybe let's add it like an app name and make it a required string, for example. Uh, and then here, we're going to inherit from CDK stack props and replace it here. So we'll say. Oops, Sting, CDK stack props. And then here, props will be CDK stack props. We could probably give it a better name than CDK stack, but just leave that for right now. Uh, and then now if we go here, we'll see that we have an error as far as uh, creating our application. It says we're missing our app name. So we could go ahead and say app name, you know, app one. So right now we're not doing anything with the app name, but let's go ahead and create a reusable um, construct out of this. So let's say we make lots of public S3 buckets in our application. Well, we could create a construct for that uh, and make it reusable, the concept of a public bucket. Just for this contrived example anyway. So let's go ahead and import a couple of things here. And then export class, so we'll call it like public bucket, extends CDK dot uh, construct. So let me just copy over our constructor here. We'll basically want to do something very similar to this. And let's define a uh, <clears throat> some props that we can pass into our public bucket, like the name. Um, trying out these Vim bindings, I'm still getting used to it in VS code. Uh, let's go ahead and give it like a name for our bucket and make it a required string. And then here we can have our public bucket props and should be required. Now we have to uh, call our super class constructor. It doesn't know anything about public bucket props. So we're just not going to pass any props in. And then if we want our uh, name, we can grab that out of, let's see, do this name props. Uh, we'll give it, we'll make it public and then let's give it a proper name. <clears throat> bucket name, name. Okay, what happened here? What did I do? Great. Uh, so now instead of creating our bucket here in line, we'll go ahead and use our reusable construct. So we'll say new public bucket uh, this, uh, pub bucket one. And we can give it some name. So let's call it, for example, app name dash bucket one. And if we want, we can create two of these. Oh, and of course, we need to define app name. 
uh, const uh, name, make props required. Uh, and then if we want, we can make multiple of these. So this is the really cool part is we can go ahead and reuse a uh, public bucket. <clears throat> and of course, we can create more and more and more complex abstract constructs out of our constructs and get fancier and fancier. So if I run this now and I deploy this, first let's take a look at our stack over here. Should hopefully see our CDK stack and our one public bucket here. Great. And we can go see that it deployed here just fine. Now I'm going to go ahead and do another deployment and it should uh, update this stack hopefully and change it to two buckets, uh, each with a um, customized name. So this is a good intro to CDK. Obviously you can get much more powerful with it. Um, and there's lots of documentation of different options here. So this describes what you can do with the S3 module, for example. <clears throat> and some of them have more you know, complex patterns. Some of them are you know, more simple, straightforward with examples. Documentation is very nice. Um, and there's a lot of other cool stuff we can do. For example, we can write tests for our infrastructure. So here, it's uh, up, got update in progress. It's currently updating. Let me just jump back and forth here, sorry. Uh, and now we can see we have two buckets, app bucket one, app bucket two created in our stack. Isn't that cool? And we can go see what the CloudFormation template looks like. Here's our two buckets. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, as I was saying, we can even write unit tests for our infrastructure. And uh, it's a good little example here. I'm just going to steal this import here real quick. Now, let's say we want to write a test to make sure that we have, you know, one of these buckets is actually cre being created. So we could say, for example, expect our stack to have resource uh, and then AWS S3 uh, bucket. And we can give it some expected properties that we uh, hope will be in the output. So for example, I believe we have app bucket one, right? So we can have app bucket one or two and expect to find that in our test. So I believe that would be bucket name, app bucket two. Now, let's say I do a test like this. Um, and here I'm missing the app name. So I can just go ahead and run uh, NPM test. You know, nothing too crazy here. And it should fail and tell me that there's no bucket name, bucket three, right? Uh, so it tells us here, bucket name mismatch. And if I want, I can go ahead and change this to bucket one. And then my test should go ahead and pass. So that's a simplified you know, overview uh, introduction. Oh, I failed here. Let's see, test bucket one, test bucket two. Oh, it should be test bucket one, not app bucket one, because I made my app name test, that's why, of course. So that value should depend on whatever the app name prop was. And there it goes, my test passes. And then once you're done with everything, you can do CDK destroy, similar to you know, how we use serverless framework, for example. And this concludes my presentation. So thanks for watching. Any questions? I do have one. Are multiple. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, please. can I do CDK to access any of those resources, actual SDK actions while in the code, or can I use this, it just to build the infrastructure? So, you mostly use it to build infrastructure. Now, there are some convenience methods for accessing a few resources. Actually, I'll go ahead and share my screen again here. Maybe I can dig up an example. So the documentation is very nice. I recommend you know, spend a little time with it if you're curious. Um, but for uh, one example that I was using is uh, you can pull in secrets. For, um, so if your stack, if you want to reference an existing secret, you can do that. And you can do it basically like this. Um, you can't reference any old um, you know, existing uh, uh, resource, although there are ways to kind of grab them by, let's say, by name, for example. Um, if we look at you know, S3 bucket, usually there's a uh, way, there's some 
ways to refer to existing things. So for example, here you could create from bucket name or from bu bucket ARN. This will give you a handle to an existing resource. Um, you can't really do stuff like, you know, call dot copy, you know, files to it or whatever. That would be cool. Um, but it, it doesn't quite go that far, but you can interact with resources that already exist. Again, you can reference a secret ARN or, you know, a secret you define elsewhere in your stack and pull in that secret and use it, you know, as a value in some part of your stack. Sure, but let's keep using the same infrastructure you already created in your presentation. Can I use the mm -hmm. S, can I reference the same S3 without have to install the S3 SDK to use any API from it? Uh, like how, do, give me an example of what you would want to do with it. Let's say I want to I'll try to understand just to upload a file to S3. I don't want to install mm -hmm. the S3 SDK and have to, to just do, I, I mean, it's already defined in, in the CDK, all the name, the region, everything else. I don't want to have to repeat that in my code later. If, you know, have two mm -hmm. places pointing to the same, two places in my code pointing to the same place in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the usual way I think that that's done is with the cloud formation output. Uh, so should be uh, some documentation in here somewhere about that. I uh, not I forget where in here that it is, but <clears throat> you could define a output that kind of emits a um, a variable, and you can reference that from within your application. So here's a stack with a couple outputs. So for example, there's a table name, and this is the name of a DynamoDB table. So in your application, you can reference a CloudFormation output. You can use the Amazon API to get a CloudFormation value. Uh, you can interpolate it in other CloudFormation stacks or in, let's say, serverless framework um, configuration, stuff like that. You can, you can define uh, the bucket or whatever resource, output the name or the ARN that your application needs to reference it, and then basically import that name. So. If, I, if my application wants to write to this table, for example, I don't have to copy and paste the name of my table. I can output it in the CloudFormation outputs and then import this into my application one way or another and use that as like the handle to the, re to the resource that was created. But I think that's about as fancy as you can get with that. I think I get it, but... I don't know, looks like a missed opportunity to make a CDK even better, to just allow me to reference my class and access its API directly. Yeah, so you're saying something like, you know, do cross bucket like this, and then you would be able to say like, <clears throat> sorry, uh, bucket dot, you know, upload file or whatever, like something like this. Yeah, you mean exactly. Yeah, that it would be cool. Um, there are certain methods that you can call on some of these resources. It's not quite you know like you're describing, but um, for example, if you were to look at a database, uh, let's see, like RDS, if you want to grant access to a database cluster, uh, you can call a method on it. So here you can actually see methods on database cluster. Uh, and I see, I don't remember exactly where the security methods are, but you can call like you know cluster dot add proxy for example, and add a new database proxy to it. Um, but again, this is still just for building the cloud the cloud formation. It's not for like runtime, you know, so to say. But yeah, that would be cool. I agree. <laughs> if you uh, file a feature request, people will read it on their GitHub. Any other questions? Yeah, like so when we create a stack with CDK, we inherit from like the base stack class. So like I assume we can deploy like a multi-stack applications uh, with mm -hmm. CDK. And like the question is like when does it make sense like to have multiple stacks in an application? Sure. So you know, one thing it's it's this simple. If you want like two stacks, you know. Three stacks, you can do it like this, and there you go. You have four stacks. 
Uh, and you can assign to a variable, of course. Um, <clears throat> so you could say like const app one, or you could say like dev, for example. And if you want to have, if you want to define everything all together, you go const this stage. And if you want to, you know, write some custom logic about how they get deployed or when they get deployed, you, you know, it's TypeScript. You can do things however you want with these constructs. Um, I think it makes sense here. You know, if you want to have different environments, you can pass in um, uh, account ID, I think, AWS, uh, I forget exactly, maybe it's ENB uh, account. Yeah, and here you would pass in some AWS account ID and region. So if you want to hard code, like I was saying, different stacks, you can. If you want to split your application up into multiple stacks, um, but you know, still have it be uh, kind of one unit, you can. You can have, um, if, if you have distinct, uh, pretty separate parts of your application that don't have anything to do with each other, you, you could put them in separate stacks. I'm not sure if there's much advantage to doing that besides keeping the complexity down. There is a limit of how many resources can live in a stack. I forget what the number is. I think it, it might be something like 200 or 2000. I, I forget, honestly, but it's not a super high limit. Um, so, you know, it may make sense to split your application up if it gets really big. Maybe you have a lot of lambdas. You know, I, I think this might be a situation we run into one day as our application gets so big. And we, if we try making a lambda for each endpoint, you know, that could quickly um, run into that issue potentially. Uh, and you can communicate sort of between your stacks. You can have cloud formation outputs from one used as inputs to another, like I was talking about earlier. And you know, if they need to reference things in the other stacks, you can totally do that kind of stuff. Um, but I'm not sure what other scenarios you would want to have multiple stacks besides those cases. So. Another question I have is when working with like cloud formation, whether it's like YAML templates or CDK, my biggest fear is like the cloud formation stack uh, getting clogged up like in some update or some rollback state. And then like you're mm -hmm. basically screwed and you need to like sit and wait for it to time out or whatever. Uh, so maybe like it's more a more general question, but uh, like what do you do in those situations? Is there any mechanism yet like to prevent that or I don't know, do something about it? Well, the good news is that it does add more, um, let's say compile time checks or pre-deployment checks um, to your application. So for example, it, normally if you're just writing CloudFormation templates by hand, if you write something that is gonna be rejected, you'll get an error. So for example, if you try to put in you know, uh, an invalid access control, it's going to tell you like at, you know, at compile time, like, sorry, that's not a valid access control property. So it does give you some more safety in that area. And furthermore, when you go to actually deploy, it does have a lot of checks um, that do kind of sanity checks on your template, on your, your constructs to make sure that your, um, I don't have a good example off the top of my head, but let's say you put in, I don't know, 10,000 gigabytes of RAM for your Docker container. It'll probably not let you deploy that. Like if you wrote that by hand in a CloudFormation template, it you would get an error and you'd have to wait for it to roll back and it would you know, be annoying. Um, stuff like that can be caught automatically by CDK and a lot of it is. It doesn't catch everything. And you know there are plenty of situations where you do something that is valid CDK that it does validate but you know, some you screwed something up, and uh, you know you do a deployment, it fails, it rolls back, takes a while, it's annoying, sure. Um, but this does get a bit closer to um, preventing that for at least like obvious dumb mistakes. So, what are the current limitations of CDK? Why like everyone isn't jumping to use it now? Well, uh, I, I think a lot of people just don't know it exists. I think that's one nah, part of can it. Can I add uh, to that yeah. question? Yeah, yeah. I kind of have something similar. Yep. If I already have an application and I use the SDKs 
to build my infrastructure. Does it make sense to try to go to CDK? Or it's more like if it's a new application, then okay, I use CDK. If not, it's probably not worth to migrate. Uh, hmm, that's a that's a good question. I I think it depends how your application is set up. So, for example, we have a number of applications using serverless, and serverless does some of the same thing CDK does. So, when you define a function with serverless, it generates CloudFormation for you. It, it's doing pretty much the same thing as if you were doing that with CDK. And you can do that with CDK. It has some wonderful uh, functions. But uh, for Lambdas, where you can actually define like a Node.js or a Python function, which is really cool. But <clears throat> let's not get sidetracked on that right now. Uh, so if you're using another tool like Terraform or um, serverless, it might be trickier to I don't convert. Like ser I don't, I don't mean any of those tools. I mean, the actually SDKs, probably what CDK uses behind the, behind the curtains. Well, it, behind the curtains, it's using the CloudFormation SDK. Yeah, the, the CloudFormation API. Yeah, uh, I mean, I can do the same because the SDK already exists for a while. So if I already use that, would I would be worth to go to CDK to try to rewrite everything to use CDK? Probably, I am guessing so far that it isn't. So that probably be one of the reasons most people are not using. Because who actually yeah, I, would care about that tool? Kind of already have a solution for it. Yeah, that's possible. <clears throat> I think a lot of people, maybe most, already use some sort of infrastructure as code, like let's say Terraform. I think Terraform is very common. And you know, if you already have your application defined like that, I don't think there's a huge value in switching to CDK. Uh, I, I agree. <clears throat> if you're starting from scratch, I, I think it's uh, worth playing around with. I'm still, I built a couple applications for myself with it um, of varying complexity. And you can look at those if anyone's interested, but uh, the complexity <clears throat> of CD, of that cloud from a, that CDK hides for you is pretty nice uh, when you're building a new application, but there are some things that it doesn't solve. So uh, one thing that I'm still not totally sure about is testing uh, locally. So it's great if you want to build your stack and deploy your application with CDK um, to Amazon, but if you want to run it locally, uh, run your application locally without deploying to Amazon, CDK won't help you with that. Now, there Amazon has some other tools that are supposed to play with it um, in particular. Yeah, that, that was going to be my next question is, have you right. tried to use it with local stack? Uh, I haven't used it with local stack, no. What Amazon pushes is the SAM CLI, the serverless application model, um, mostly for Lambda, for running like Lambdas locally. And this is, you know, this is how, you, if you want, you can just, uh, use CDK and SAM together to run your app serverless application on your machine. I don't think it's very mature yet, the integration between them. I mean, you can see here, it's not the nicest thing. You have to like stick it in a, you have to like stick it in a file and then rewrite it and then like execute like, the, you know, that's no fun. So I think there's still some way to go before that is as convenient as, you know, serverless framework, for example. So it's, CDK doesn't solve all of your problems by itself. It, I think it's a piece of, you know, maybe a, a, a toolkit that you would use for development, depending on what you're building. If you're just deploying resources, you're not building like a serverless application, it's probably enough on its own. But if you're, you know, building Lambdas and want to run locally like we do, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure it's quite there yet. And there's a couple plugins for serverless framework, but I tried both of them and it's it's not a very pleasant experience yet. Um, I I think we could eventually ditch serverless framework and just use CDK and SAM, but I don't know uh, if it's quite as convenient yet to do that. I think it, it will be. But if you want to see, so this is a little application that I was building myself. It has one or two lambdas, uh, and it looks something like this. So. Um, I have like a Slack webhook secret that I grabbed from Secrets Manager here. Uh, and then I have a API gateway. So this lets you create a REST API gateway 
with cores set up and x-ray trace and enabled. And then you can add like a resource and then um, attach like a Lambda handler to that resource. So you can say, okay, slash sites. If I do a get to slash sites. So see so you can do like sites resource that add method. This is the cool like object oriented, you know, goodies you get with CDK. Uh, a Lambda integration using this Node.js function. And this is TypeScript. It'll compile your TypeScript app for you. And you give it the in entry point and you know, that's it. That's, that's how you define like a function, for example, using CDK. So uh, I think it's, it's great for building this, but you know, to your question, Dimitro, it's the, the local testing is not as convenient, definitely as it's not as well integrated as a uh, serverless framework is yet, but Again, this is all just TypeScript code. It, you can write modules or applications using it or customize it however you want. And I'm sure people will, maybe we will, who knows, uh, you know, end up building whatever little toolkit on top to make our lives more convenient with it. It's certainly more, you know, it, it's very extensible, which is what I like about it. Have you tried to use it for an application that is not serverless? Um, yes. Yes, 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 I did. So I was trying for a while to deploy Limmy, um, which is, uh, let's see, I'm not sure if I can just Google for it like this, but it's a, uh, what's the word, activity plug? It's a little kind of Reddit clone. Let's see, maybe they have a demo here. Uh, it's, it looks like this. It's basically a clone of Reddit. It's written in Rust, uh, and it is made up of a number of Docker containers. So uh, I actually tried to deploy this with CDK. It was rather complicated. Um, <laughs> still, a lot easier than writing CloudFormation by hand. Um, but it's not serverless. It's actually defining um, Docker containers that are connected together with load balancer in front. And I can link this if you want to take a look at it. Um, but this is more, this is definitely the most complex thing I've done with it. So if you want to see from the top, um, <clears throat> this is the whole stack, if you want to, an example. So I create a VPC, I create a database. Now, most of these I define. So database is over here. So this creates a Aurora Postgres serverless database. You can give it, you know, your scaling config and all that. Uh, I also create a um, secret for it. Let's see, I forget where the secret lives. It's not here, but I create a security group. And so I create these little constructs and then I kind of have that quote unquote outputs as public properties on the class. So this database has like, for example, a cluster and security group properties. And so my stack, I create a database and then I can access like say the security group like this. So. I can create a bastion host. Now, this is one of the coolest things about CDK actually is this bastion pattern. You give it, um, let's see, what does it look like? It's basically as simple as this. You say bastion host Linux, you give it a security group and tell it if you want to be in a public subnet. And then you can you know, define SSH hosts in a key pair. And this generates a, you know, it'll create an EC2 Linux instance that you can SSH into and use to access your database or anything else in your VPC. <laughs> Doing this with CloudFormation is an absolute nightmare. It's enormous. It's very unpleasant. So I love this. This is super cool. Uh, but what you can do is you can do stuff like database.securitygroup.add ingress rule bastion.securitygroup. And so this lets you, you know, grant access to your bastion host to the database. So I think that stuff's really cool. Um, but the, the application lives, so I create a load balancer. Uh, and so the load balancer has, is a kind of a complicated application. It has, I think, four, three target groups. There's a backend, there's a front end Node.js application, and then there's a thing called iFramely, uh, which handles uh, iframing stuff and like a link preview kind of service. So these are three different load balancer target groups. There's a, you know, I create a load balancer listeners. You can do, you know, complex routing on your load balancer like this. <clears throat> uh, you know, if the header is activity pub, then you can tell it to route to the backend, for example. Uh, all this kind of cool, fancy stuff. Um, you know, it's it's pretty verbose, but it 
describes everything that you need. It, it doesn't really have anything extra. Like you're not, it doesn't force you to do a lot of extra work. It's all kind of information that is needed, unfortunately, or whatever. But, uh, and then the applications themselves, like the backend looks something like this. Uh, essentially, it's just this. This creates a task definition for a uh, Docker container. So here I'm using this container image from asset and you just give it a path to a directory. So this is a directory in my system and it has a Docker file. And so this will actually build that Docker image and then deploy it to Fargate. And then you can you know, give it, expose a port, give it some uh, environment variables, hook up uh, the CloudWatch logs, all that good stuff. And so, yeah, this is what a non-serverless application can look like. Does that give you kind of a picture? Even yeah, it did. Your jot secret uh, key here. And I kind of have another question now. Uh, have you tried to <laughs> yeah. use it with another language that is not TypeScript? I've only played with TypeScript. Um, like I said, there's Python, C Sharp, and Java. Also, you can use it with just plain JavaScript if you're, you know, a pervert. Yeah, sure. Uh, but but uh, yeah. The point of my question was that earlier in the presentation, you mentioned that CDK has some nice features like validating in the compile time some properties, probably not all mm -hmm. of them. But isn't that more like a power from TypeScript where you can define those validations in? you know, in the interfaces and all, while if I was writing Python, maybe I wouldn't have all that. Yeah, uh, totally. And that's why I use TypeScript. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you can go, this is what it looks like, for example, this is the Node.js function. You can even just go look at the source and see what it's doing. So, you know, this is, so yeah, one, la one layer of validation obviously is the types. So, that's like a nice check. And then there's also the, you know, we could call that a compile time check. And that's these types here, of course. Uh, and then there's the, um, I don't know if you want to call it runtime or compile time. It's compile time of your CDK app, but it's runtime of the, you know, uh, CDK compiler. But, you know, there's some extra checks here. And I assume that these checks are present in, let's say, Python, but the types, maybe there's some type checks, but they're not. I don't know, maybe it's written, maybe it has full MyPy annotations in the Python app. I'm not sure, but yeah, just use TypeScript and problem solved. Are there any like pricing intricacies when it comes to CDK? Or oh, like, it, it doesn't matter like what you use to deploy those cloud formation templates? Oh. Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of any extra pricing that's involved. At the end of the day, it's the same CloudFormation, you know, create stack, update stack, API calls. It's not doing anything uh, extra with Amazon, as far as I know. It, the only thing it does is it creates a CDK toolkit stack for you. And this, I think it just basically shoves your CloudFormation templates in an S3 bucket for you automatically. I, I think that's all it does, really. Um, so, okay, maybe you pay for that bucket, but I, I, I don't think it has any other, you know, extra costs associated with it. <laughs>